out of the firing line. Reports of air attacks are seldom without the names of the firms which produce the planes. Falk, Wolf, Heinkel, Lancaster feature where once the talk was of cuirassiers, lancers, and hussars. The mechanism for re reproducing life, for dominating and for destroying it is exactly the same, and accordingly industry, state, and advertising are amalgamated. The old exaggeration of skeptical liberals that war was a business has come true. State power has shed even the appearance of independence from particular interests in profit, always in their service really, and now also places itself there ideologically. Every laudatory mention of the chief contractor in the destruction of cities helps to earn it the good name that will secure it the best commissions in their rebuilding. Like the Thirty Years' War, this too, a war whose beginning no one will remember when it comes to an end, falls into discontinuous campaigns separated by empty pauses. The Polish campaign, the Norwegian, the Russian, the Tunisian, the invasion. Its rhythm, the alternation of jerky action and total standstill for lack of geographically attainable enemies, has the same mechanical quality which characterizes individual military instruments, and which too is doubtless what has resurrected the pre-liberal form of the campaign. But this mechanical rhythm completely determines the human relation to the war, not only in the disproportion between individual bodily strength and the energy of machines, but in the most hidden cells of experience. Even in the previous conflict, the body's incongruity with mechanical warfare made real experience impossible. No one could have recounted it as even the artillery general Napoleon's battles could be recalled. The long interval between the war memoirs and the conclusion of peace is not fortuitous. It testifies to the painful reconstruction of memory, which in all the books conveys a sense of impotence and even falseness, no matter what terrors the writers have passed through. But the second war is as totally divorced from experience as is the functioning of a machine from the movements of the body, which only begins to resemble it in pathological states. Just as the war lacks continuity, history, an epic element, but seems rather to start anew from the beginning in each phase, so it will leave behind no permanent, unconsciously preserved image in the memory. Everywhere, with each explosion, it has breached the barrier against stimuli beneath which experience, the lag between healing oblivion and healing recollection, forms. Life has changed into a timeless succession of shocks, interspaced with empty, paralyzed intervals. But nothing, perhaps, is more ominous for the future than the fact that, quite literally, these things will soon be passed, thinking on, for each trauma of the returning combatants, each shock not inwardly absorbed, is a ferment of future destruction. Karl Krauss was right to call his play The Last Days of Mankind. What is being enacted now ought to bear the title, After Doomsday. The total obliteration of the war by information, propaganda, commentaries, with cameramen in the first tanks and war reporters dying heroic deaths, the mishmash of enlightened and manipulation of public opinion and oblivious activity, all this is another expression for the withering of experience, the vacuum between men and their fate, in which their real fate lies. It is as if the reified, hardened plaster cast of events takes the place of events themselves. Men are reduced to walk-on parts in a monster documentary film which has no spectators, since the least of them has his bit to do on the screen. It is just this aspect that underlies the much maligned designation, phony war. Certainly the term has its origin in the fascist inclination to dismiss the reality of horror as mere propaganda in order to perpetrate it unopposed. But like all fascist tendencies, this too has its source in elements of reality, which assert themselves only by virtue of the fascist attitude malignantly insinuating them. The war is really phony, but with a phoniness more horrifying than all the horrors, and those who mock at it are principal contributors to disaster. Had Hegel's philosophy of history embraced this age, Hitler's robot bombs would have found their place beside the early death of Alexander and similar images, as one of the selected empirical facts by which the state of the world spirit manifests itself directly in symbols. Like fascism itself, the robot's career without a subject. 
Like it, they combine utmost technical perfection with total blindness. And like it, they arouse mortal terror and are wholly futile. I have seen the world's spirit, not on horseback, but on wings and without a head. And that refutes, at the same stroke, Hegel's philosophy of history. The idea that after this war, life will continue normally, or even that culture might be rebuilt, as if the rebuilding of culture were not already its negation, is idiotic. Millions of Jews have been murdered, and this is to be seen as an interlude and not the catastrophe itself. What more is this culture waiting for? And, and even if countless people still have time to wait, is it conceivable that what happened in Europe will have no consequences? That the quantity of victims will not be transformed into a new quality of society at large, barbarism. As long as blow is followed by counterblow, catastrophe is perpetuated. One need only think of revenge for the murdered. If as many of the others are killed, horror will be institutionalized and the pre-capitalist pattern of vendettas, confined from time immemorial to remote mountainous regions, will be reintroduced in extended form, with whole nations as the subjectless subjects. If, however, the dead are not avenged and mercy is exercised, fascism will, despite everything, get away with its victory scot-free, and having once been shown so easy will be continued elsewhere. The logic of history is as destructive as the people that it brings to prominence. Wherever its momentum carries it, it reproduces equivalents of past calamity. Normality is death. To the question, what is to be done with defeated Germany, I could say only two things in reply. Firstly, at no price, on no conditions, would I wish to be an executioner or to supply legitimations for executioners. Secondly, I should not wish, least of all, with legal machinery to stay the hand of anyone who was avenging past misdeeds. This is a thoroughly unsatisfactory, contradictory answer, one that makes a mockery of both principle and practice but perhaps the fault lies in the question and not only in me. Cinema, newsreel, the invasion of the Marianas, including Guam. The impression is not of battles, but of civil engineering and blasting operations undertaken with immeasurably intensified vehemence. Also of fumigation, insect extermination on a terrestrial scale. Works are put in hand until no grass grows. The enemy acts as patient and corpse- like the Jews under fascism he features now as merely the object of technical and administrative measures. And should he defend himself, his own action immediately takes on the same character. Satanically, indeed, more initiative is in a sense demanded here than in old-style war. It seems to cost the subject his whole energy to achieve subjectlessness. Consummate in humanity is the realization of Edward Gray's humane dream, War Without Hatred.